morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 395 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Prior Media Network. Yay! Today, recording day is Sunday. June 2nd, 2024, so this is a pre-record for a broadcast on Monday, June 3rd, 2024, and uh, according to the weather reports, it's going to be a beautiful day here at the Beaver Lodge. I'm your host, the eager beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Eager, hey, and as you will notice, I'm not at uh, my regular station because it seems that uh, the computer is probably about to die. So uh, I'm going to have to get a new one relatively soon. Uh, yay, technology. Uh, <laughs> with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misty Mysteries from Covered Wood Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, how is your mental health today, sir? You know, all things considered, it's not terrible. I'm just exhausted like physically exhausted it's been a very long weekend uh running doing busy stuff things here there everywhere uh yeah i'm just really really tired and i gotta take miss lola out shortly so <laughs> yeah that's where i'm at mm, yeah yeah i'm a bit tired too uh we've been doing some garden stuff we had uh three cubic yards of dirt well, topsoil and mushroom compost and manure, so it's a <sighs> lovely smell. I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. Yeah, but uh, yes, we're, we're doing the thing, uh, putting the, the, the cardboard down and two inches of soil and all mm. that, that mix and whatnot so that we can uh, have the garden. And it's about 400 square feet, so it's more like a mini farm than a garden. Mm. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing that. So it, it, it's going well, and we've got great weather for it. But it's, it's uh, you know, to a wheelbarrow, bring wheelbarrow, you know, like this, and then, you know, cut off, you know, cardboard boxes and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's, it's not the most, well, I mean, it's fun work because, you know, we're building our garden, but, I mean, it's not the most fun thing to be doing, uh, moving earth, but... Uh, once, once it all gets in there, then good things will start happening. Indeed. So, yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, I'm not sure, um, Susan, do you hear some noise behind me? It's a little, little echoey, but it's not, uh, it's not oh. terrible. Okay, I, I was just, uh, my beaver sweetie's in the other room talking on the phone, but for some reason, um, he talks very, very, very loud on the cell phone. So I can't hear him. I can't hear him. Answering anything. Okay, cool. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right, kids and cubs. Uh, well, uh, number one, uh, we are recording on Sunday night uh, as the Edmonton Oilers have uh, taken to the ice for what could possibly be a uh, series clincher in the Western Conference. So go Oilers. As soon as we're done with this, uh, we'll be uh, going uh, to the match 
so I can uh, watch it. Yeah, but the, and the Rangers are out. They got bounced by uh, Florida last night. So it's uh, Florida uh, Panthers will be in the final with either Edmonton or Dallas. I'm hoping Edmonton. Me and, too. You know, I, pff, hey, they, I think they got as good a chance as anybody. Well, yeah. And it would be the, the Florida Panthers' second year in a row, right? Mm, they were in the finals? Don't quote me on that. I don't, I don't, I don't recall okay. who was in the finals last year. <laughs> Dude, I, I can't remember what I had for dinner last night. <laughs> I don't know who was in the finals last year. Oh, all right, all right. Uh, yeah, Panthers and Golden Knights. Yeah, was it Vegas won it last year? I thought that was yeah, two years ago. Yeah, 4-1. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right, yeah. yeah. All right, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully a Canadian team in the finals, finally. Um, other things uh, going on sports news that uh, it was Canada had a great hit though the French Open uh, on Friday with uh, all the players winning their second round matches to uh, reach the third round mm-hmm. uh, but then uh, the third round the matchups were pretty um, let's just say that it would have been very possible for all four to be eliminated there and they would have been eliminated against worthy competition and Okay. Right. So uh, it was just a you know luck of the draw that uh, when they hit the the third round that everybody they played was like seated way higher and mm. that type of stuff. But uh, Felix Ogieliasin got to the fourth round and then uh, you know met up with Carlos Alcaraz on clay. That was the end of it. I didn't I didn't see any of it, and I uh, I know Wimbledon starts what. Soon, not too long ago. Yeah, yeah. The the Australian Open and the French Open have like the longest gap, and then it's like French Open May yeah. and early June, and then Wimbledon in July, and yeah. then and then U.S. Open in September, right? And and this year we had an Olympic year, so there's an Olympic tournament as well. I thought Wimbledon in was in June. Pardon? I thought Wimbledon was in June. Late June over early July. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but uh, that's going on. So, yeah, so all the Canadians are now eliminated in singles, and there's basically only uh, uh, in doubles. Uh, Leila Annie Fernandez, who's playing with Aaron Robliff, ironically, who's Gabrielle Wadabowski's double partner, another Canadian uh, player, but uh, she seems to be out uh, for a while. I haven't seen her in the draws for a while. Okay. So, uh, so uh, yeah, she's uh, she stepped in, So uh, and uh, it's been very, very rainy, so uh, if you're a double fan, uh, You've been uh, they're a little behind schedule because usually mm-hmm. they, they're well into the doubles draw by the time of the second week and there's still some uh, like first and second round matches as well like maybe second round matches can be played but anyway uh, there's only Leila and Elite Fernandez left in the uh, in the doubles so uh, we will uh, uh, cheer for them and and uh, like I said the Oilers at the moment all right hell yeah let's go Oilers. Oilers yes. Uh, on Friday's show, there's, uh, there was something that had happened a few days before, and we had missed it, uh, but we're going to bring it to you today. Uh, we're going to play a, an interview uh, from Power and Politics, I believe uh, it was the May 29th episode. Um, we could have started at the beginning, Mr. Chris, when we do, uh, but we don't go, uh, I think I, I gave you a uh, I think I sent you the long one, so it will end in about like 17 minutes or so, but you'll see, because okay. the next part will be oh, this is 33 about. minutes, this, this. Uh, yeah, clip. exactly. So at some point, the interview will end. There's more space, but you'll be, you'll, it'll be clear when we need to end it. Okay. Um, I'm going to play it all. Okay. Uh, because it's something that uh, people should see, uh, because uh, the climate issue and the carbon tax, um, the conservatives have been, make, been making a lot of hay, and they've been pointing to the parliamentary budget officers report saying um, on the one hand, you know, on a net transfer basis, money in, money out, you're better off. But if you include all of these things over time and, you know, you're, you're, you're slightly not as well off or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the conservatives have been choosing to point to that number rather than the other one, the one that any normal person would use. Uh, and it seems that, uh, in the process of doing that as well while doing the calculation of sort of like you know future value of money and all that type of stuff or i don't know how what it is to be calculated but you know 
all the other impacts to get the amount that says that we're a little worse off, but did not do the accounting of the counterfactual. What if we did nothing? And how much would that cost us? Right. So it turns out that uh, the Parliamentary Budget Office had noticed that there was an error made mm -hmm. in that report because they had included some uh, numbers that should not have been in there to create this number. And apparently they issued a slow correction, uh, a slow correction, a quiet correction, and I think it is in April, uh, but it didn't really get much public attention. Mm -hmm. So a liberal MP uh, had written it to ask that uh, a brighter spotlight be shined on it uh, because this is kind of important information that uh, the public should know. Um, and now all of a sudden we have calls for the parliamentary budget officer to resign. Um, yeah, I now, did hear about that the other day. I just didn't yeah. know quite why. I'm like, what? Yeah. What's going on here? I don't, I don't know the whole gist of it. So, yeah. so the thing going on here, there's like, okay, in politics, everybody asks people to resign all the time. Mm -hmm. But you have the performative outreach thing, like the thing with Greg Fergus, when the liberals sent out a message, the party sent out a message, you know, come to this evening like this, we'll talk about careful, you this and that and this, you know, and come and spend an evening with Greg Fergus. And that's the standard wording they have for all their MPs when they send that out to all the writings. But Greg Fergus happens to be the speaker, so whenever you get here, you're supposed to set his aside and do something else with it. And they didn't. So there was a big scandal. And then all the conservatives said Greg Fergus must resign. This is like the fourth or fifth time he's shown partisanship. But it's like in this case, it was literally he did nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's like, Jesus, this is my party. Like the party even apologized for it. Like apologized, like it's not me. But they still wanted the black man to resign for something. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. That's the one type of demand of resignation. And how long has he been in that position for? Six months? Yes, yeah, six, seven months or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a little tempestuous. But just because conservatives are trying to make him controversial doesn't mean that he is. Um, so that's the one type of call for resignation. The other type of call for resignation happens um, when somebody actually does screw up for real. So this was an actual mess up. And they did issue the correction, but they downplayed it. And the reason why they're asking for his resignation now is that in this interview, you will see that uh, the parliamentary budget officer, uh, officer Kind of seems to downplay it and maybe be a little. I don't know if you would say he was defensive, but okay, not, I've not seen this yet, so I not, have no idea. Yeah, not accepting the not willing to take on the full weight of what this error can mean. Uh, because in his assessment, uh, once the calculations are made, it the difference won't be that significant. You have the Liberals, you have the Minister of Environment saying specifically that, you know, uh, when the new numbers are added, that uh, the government will be vindicated. So, you know, when we start talking about words like, using words like vindicated or like that, you had better hope people are right because, you know, somebody's going to do the recalculation at some point and the numbers are going to come out, and, you know. But it seems that uh, there wasn't, there might have not been enough, like, oh, my God, you know, no, this is so bad. We're, we're really, really sorry. You know, we've taken these measures so this doesn't happen again. And it seems like it's an, an error that they should have caught. Given, um, you have to understand, given the rigor of the department and given as a parliamentary watchdog, right, they get a long term and we invest a lot of trust in them. You know, when the Auditor General of Canada says something, we pay attention to them. And we've had some Auditor Generals, like Sheila Fraser, not in the past, Denis Deshotel, who almost became political stars in a certain way because the reports were just so good. But, you know, they weren't seeking the limelight, but they uncovered some stuff that we needed to know about. Um, so we put a lot of trust in our watchdogs and the heads of certain departments. And the parallel that I'm going to draw here, because I mentioned them often, 
is Mr. Munio Sheikh, who is the head of Statistics Canada. Oh, Stephen yes, Harper, right, yes. Was the Prime Minister. And when Stephen Harper was planning to change the census such that we don't go up to everyone and send something, mm-hmm. right? But we rely on other data and we pull mm-hmm. that type of data to create the type of conferences, which is another way of doing it. But he turned around and said that Statistics Canada told him that doing it this alternate way will give him results that are just as reliable. Now, any statistician worth their salt knows that the results were not going to be just as reliable by doing it the other way. So, as the Prime Minister of Canada walking up to a microphone and a camera and saying, the head of Statistics Canada told me that if we do this in this alternate way, the results will be just as reliable. Mm-hmm. The reputation of the head of Statistics Canada among all his peers in the world of statistics is now on the line because everybody knows that that's not true. So he has a choice now of saying, yes, I said that, and keeping his job as head of Statistics Canada, but being the laughing stock in the field, and his career is essentially over, because he loses mm-hmm. all credibility, or going up to Mike Ephron and saying, uh, I never said that, and I resigned. I guess he could have not he could have not gone for microphone and just resigned in protest and not told Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, his reputation, it's not that it was maligned maliciously, but what the Prime Minister, if you want to assume that Stephen Harper had been malicious, that's one thing, but if you want to assume that he's just being careless, it's still the Prime Minister of a G7 nation going to a microphone saying that where the entire world monitors this type of stuff. Say, hey, Canada's about to change the way they do their census. That's big news. I said, oh, the data is going to be just, really? Head of Statistics Canada, one of the top three statistical bodies in the entire world, said that, really? And this was this man's dream job. Yunir Sheikh had dreamed all his life of becoming the head of Statistics Canada, and he hadn't been in the position long. And he said, I, I, that's just not true. I didn't say that. The results would not be just as valid, and uh, I have to step aside. That's an honorable resignation. This type of thing, where the Parliamentary Budget Office puts out a report that has information that normal checks and balances and double check. So I shouldn't say check and balances, but um, checks and verifications to make sure that the information that is going out actually is because you know, especially on anything having to do with carbon taxing, carbon pricing, as soon as it goes public, political vultures are there waiting to jump on it to spin it in the worst way possible. So if there is an incorrect information in there, it's almost like the James Comey thing when they found the computer with like about 12 days left or a couple of days left. They said there might be something on it rather than taking the computer, seeing what was on it, seeing what information they had and whether or not there was a deal or not. Because we found it, there's stuff on it. So it just, and then boom, the whole election turned. It turns out there was nothing on it. So... This is a big error. It goes to the, the, the amount the level of trust that Canadians can have in that office. And it's not so much that they made an error because errors are made, but it's how they tried to cover up and now how much to kind of sort of owning up to the gravity mm-hmm. of this type of error and wanting to assume the responsibility which sort of compounds the error. All right. So this is what we're going to be looking at. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, if you will. We begin with that report from the Parliamentary Budget Officer that has been cited for months by critics of the federal carbon tax. The PBO now says there was an error. The report was meant to just examine the consumer carbon price and its impacts, but the report also mistakenly factored in the impact of industrial carbon pricing. 
A correction was quietly issued back in April, and we only found out about this because Liberal MP and Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance, Ryan Turnbull, wrote a letter asking the PBO to correct the record more publicly. Turnbull says the mistake means the cost of carbon pricing was overestimated to Canadians. He writes, at a time when misinformation on carbon pricing is running rampant, this is deeply unfortunate, as your office has a well-earned reputation for nonpartisan and rigorous analysis. Yves Giroux is the Parliamentary Budget Officer, and he joins me now. Mr. Giroux, welcome back to the show. My pleasure. This report that you released, which has become uh, something of, of, of a, a controversial document in climate arguments politically in the last little while, you've now issued a correction on this. This was supposed to only do an economic analysis of consumer carbon pricing. You've now revealed that your data included an impact of industrial carbon pricing as well. How did that happen? Well, in fact, what we wanted or need to do when we try to assess the economic impact of a policy that's already in place, like carbon pricing. We know the impact on the economy right now. We know what the economy is. What we need to do is having a counterfactual. So that means estimating what the Canadian economy would be without carbon pricing. Our intention was to do just that, but look at the impact of the economy without a carbon tax. But what we found out subsequently was that in our modeling, we removed the carbon tax, but also the industrial emission. So that was an inadvertent error um, that happened in the modeling of the, uh, of the carbon pricing, <coughs> sorry, the cost or the impact, the economic impacts. That being said, it's not something that should or will alter the overall conclusions of the report because the industrial emissions are exempt at about 80%. For big emitters, it's only the 20% that's the top emissions that are that are uh, subject to to the carbon tax or emissions, depending on the jurisdiction. So overall, the economic impact will still be negative. It might change a little bit the quantum for some specific income quintiles when we talk about the overall impact of the carbon tax or carbon pricing and we will be updating we are in the process of updating our our analysis and we hope to be able to release an updated modeling mm -hmm. taking in town and taking into account what i just talked about but also the carve out of heating oil and the fact that some more provinces are in the federal backstop regime Okay, but, but, but just help me understand that, how uh, the inclusion of industrial pricing, in your view, doesn't change your overall conclusions. Because you come to a, a pretty stark conclusion, one that is being cited by the Conservatives mm -hmm. when looking at the economic impact, that the bulk of Canadians are going to be worse off yep. under this. If you look at the straight fiscal impact of just the commercial pricing system with the rebate, most Canadians are better off and cash out, cash in. Yes. The industrial policy is projected to be responsible for up to 50% of the emission reductions the country's on track for by about 2030, like up to 90 megatons. How can removing the economic impact of that and the costs associated with it from these calculations only have a marginal impact in, in your view? Well, I'm not sure it's that much in terms of the contribution of industrial emitters to overall reductions. Uh, but as I mentioned, about 80% of emissions for big emitters are exempt from carbon tax. So uh, it's only the top 20% that are ex uh, subject to carbon tarification or pricing. And there's already pressure on big emitters to reduce their emissions, uh, talking about ESG standards, uh, pressures from stakeholders and shareholders. So it's something that was already underway to a certain extent, even in jurisdictions that are not subject to carbon pricing. So, and just going back to the basics, if you impose carbon pricing on an economy as diverse, but also as dependent on fossil fuels as Canada, it's bound to happen that there will be negative economic consequences. Sure, and my estimates on that were based on what the Climate Institute put out, that industrial policy could be up to 48% of the emissions by 2030. That's what I was basing that on. But why are you waiting until fall to update this? This, your, your report is cited every day in question period, practically. It has become, you know, it has become weaponized, whether you intended it for that or not, in the political arguments about this. Why wait until the fall? Why not get this out now or just rerun the numbers from your existing reports? Well, it's not that straightforward. It's not just an Excel spreadsheet that you just update a few numbers. It requires massive coding and modeling of an economy that is as complex as the Canadian economy. 
and also modeling the behavior of thousands of economic actors, including several big emitters and households by income quintile, by province, nationally. So it's not something as straightforward. And we want the model to be robust when we release our updated numbers. And we not only will need to update it for the issue we're discussing today, but also for the fact that we have new data that's coming in. Uh, there's been a carve out for heating oil and there's also more jurisdictions that are in compared to our last report. But for the historical record in terms of like, so we can look at what the actual pitch snapshot was when this report that, that mm -hmm. has been the controversial one was, was executed, why not take a separate process to get this fixed so people actually know what the numbers are? Because I know you say broadly, it may still show people are worse off, but being worse off by say $50 to the negative as opposed to $2,000 to the negative dramatically changes things. Well, I don't think it'll be that dramatic because for one, the reports were out for almost two years, the first one, nobody flagged that. We discovered it in our regular process of updating our report. And as you mentioned, this or these reports have been the subject of heavy scrutiny by various stakeholders. And nobody pointed out that, oh, the numbers seem off. People accepted and agreed that there will be economic, negative economic impacts. The quantum, people didn't, nobody in the know seemed to be surprised by the quantum that we released. So I don't think when we release the report, I don't think there'll be a significant change. I think it'll be based on, on what we know and based on discussions we've had since, with various stakeholders, we believe that the adjustment will be minor. I don't think it will be significant. Did you let people look under the hood, though? Were they able to look at your modeling and the data inputs yeah. that you use in this? And when, so, yeah, when we have these questions. How did questions, nobody catch the output-based systems inclusion then? Because it's very complex modeling, as I said. So people are free to ask questions, and we share our assumptions, our modeling, our data, uh, when we can, when it's not mm. confidential data that's provided to us, uh, we share that with people who ask questions. But, but knowing how controversial this was and how any change in the underlying assumptions in these conclusions, how, how political that would be, uh, why was this just announced on your webpage in a small update in the middle of April? Here we are at the end of May, and we're only kind of finding out about this now. Like this, it seems to me there should have been a larger declaration to the public that, hey, our assumptions may need to change, and you need to reconsider these findings based on that. Well, I can tell you that many government departments regularly scan our website. So there were government departments who were very well aware of that announcement the moment we, we posted, posted that on our website. And we also got questions from stakeholders, from parliamentarians. We answered these questions. And the real numbers, or uh, the, the real issue will be when we release updated numbers. And then we'll issue a press release. We'll, 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 we'll post that when, but, it's, when it's available. But there have been confidence motions to try to defeat this government in large part based on the arguments contained in this report. It, it feels like, I get press releases from your office all the time when you put out a new report, no matter what mm -hmm. it is. A correction to something like this feels like there should have been a, a broader notification to people on your Twitter feed, a press release, something, rather than if you weren't actively, aggressively monitoring your webpage, you would have missed this. We didn't see it until now. Well, there's no update as of now. We're in the process of updating, of updating our report. And as I said, the conclusions, the overall conclusions, the qualitative conclusions will very likely remain the same. That is imposing a carbon pricing on an economy that's as dependent on fossil fuels has negative economic impacts. Nobody disputes that. Okay, but uh, the last time uh, you were in here was right before that confidence motion. Uh, it might have been the day off it happened, if I remember correctly, when they were tr the conservatives were trying to stop the April 1 increase in carbon price, and they were citing this, and we walked through some of the findings and the criticism of, of this particular report. And, and one of the things that we, we raise in this is what the critics have said, is that the only counterfactual this considers is no carbon pricing whatsoever. And mm -hmm. now we find out that doesn't just include the consumer carbon price that we pay when we fill up our cars, this applies to the industrial pricing. Given where this debate has gone, I mean, don't, do, are you going to broaden your analysis to look at 
as, as MPs have written you, the benefits of carbon pricing, the costs of climate change, because it feels like the conversation has devolved into a value of the liberal policy versus doing nothing. And nobody sees doing nothing as a viable option. Like, doesn't this need to be broadened to have more comparison points, given where this has gone over the last couple of years? These, these are good questions. So I would say when you want to determine or try to assess the economic impacts of a policy that's currently in place, your counterfactual has to be what would the economy be in the absence of this. It's by no means intended to be an interpretation or a suggestion that doing nothing is the right thing to do. It's just the way to estimate the economic impact of policies that are in place. Um, the second point I would say is that uh, it, it's not as straightforward as one would suggest to update a report of that magnitude and that complexity. And um, that's what we are in the process of, of doing right now. Right, but, but what we've ended up with, and, and I, I'm, I'm sure this was not your intention, but the way it has evolved in the, in the broader public policy political argument is that people are ma passing judgment on, on the effectiveness of a climate policy based on the downside of it, not compared to anything else, right? It, 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 do you regret that, that this is where it has ended up? Well, I, I think there's one very fundamental thing to keep in mind. We are mandated to provide estimate and analysis on the cost of policy proposals. Mm -hmm. The government is usually quite adept at promoting the benefits of its own policies. Where there is sometimes a gap is assessing the economic consequences or the cost of these policy proposals. And I think when it comes to carbon pricing, the government has done a good job of explaining the necessity of addressing climate change and implementing its policies. But it didn't, to my knowledge, release uh, lots of studies on the potential negative economic consequences of pricing carbon emissions. And that's where my mandate is. Right, but, but uh, you know, the way this has evolved, I mean, it is where it is, you know, Mr. Giroux. It, it, you, this has become, you're being credited as the referee, and now the referee has admitted there was a mistake in this, though it may not have changed the outcome of the game. Right? I wouldn't it, say it, a mistake. Know? There's a modeling tweak that should have been made that is in the process of being corrected, and we'll know the impact once we have run the modeling. Right, but I mean, I mean, the report does say very much in the second paragraph that the scope of this report is limited to the federal fuel charge. I yes. mean, it tells us this is the yes. basis of this, and then now we find out that is not the basis of the analysis. There is more in there, the quantum of which you say we'll find out later in the fall because of its complexity. But, but it, 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 I, I go back to my question that we've ended up in, in a debate in Parliament using your report that it is all the downside of climate policy with no independent assessment of the upside of climate mm -hmm. policy. So then we have to take politicians' words for it as opposed to uh, parliamentary officers' word for it. The, the request has been for you to broaden it. I, I, I just, I and, wonder and why not do that before the election. And we have, and we have tried to assess the economic impacts of climate change, but it's a nascent industry or, or sector of study. It's not that easy to assess the economic impacts of climate change on a country as diverse as Canada, but we've tried to do that. So when people say you have not taken into account the cost of climate change, we've tried, but has the government done that? It seems that many people are relying on a small office to do what the government should be doing. So I'm, I'm wondering how fair these criticisms or these critics are. Well, I, I mean, that's a fair point in terms of resource scale, but, but if it is complicated and difficult to assess the downside of unabated climate change or the cost of climate change, how can we then credibly assess the economic impact of climate policy without the counterbalancing effect it may have on these negatives? Like even in some of the output-based uh, programs we've seen provincially, Alberta and Saskatchewan take money and they put it into a fund. Mm -hmm. So that is the 20% of the big emitters you mentioned, it gets yeah. paid, but then that goes into investment in R&D and other economic activities. So there's an economic lift that comes from the recycling of that money that wouldn't be reflected in this, correct? Uh, probably not because the amounts are not that big compared to mm the first liter of gasoline that you and I buy or the first cubic meter of gas that we use in our homes. Whereas for big emitters, 80% of their emissions are free. It's only the top 20%, generally speaking, that are priced. So 
it, it, yes, the numbers can be daunting and it can be very complex, but the moment you impose a cost on greenhouse gas emissions, there has to be negative economic consequences, certainly for the first couple of years. After that, there could be technical changes, technological changes that mitigate these negative impacts. But in the span of a few years, six years, for example, it's very difficult to have sufficient technological um, developments to make the transition seamless and cost-free. So if the, if the complexity is too severe and the PBO lacks the resources relative to the government, we are likely having a, an election thought heavily on this policy and its economic and cost of living impacts. How do Canadian voters get a clear assessment of this? Because the government putting something out would be seen as politically self-interested. You're, you're conceding that your capacity is limited and your analysis is narrow in scope for all the reasons that we've outlined. How do Canadians, how do we have a clear picture of the full meaning of the climate policy that is in place that people could decide the next election? Well, I wouldn't say our analysis is narrow. It's still assessing the economic consequences. Not as broad of, as the critics say it should be. It's not say. like estimating everything that's mm -hmm. related to carbon pricing. For example, the benefit of Canada being seen or not at the forefront of addressing climate change and so on. There would be benefits, obviously, to doing that, but we try to swallow or, or, or take a big bite in that debate by assessing the cost of carbon pricing itself, which is no small undertaking, and we're updating that. Whereas, when you say, uh, what are Canadians to do, uh, that's, that's a good question. They have to listen to stakeholders, to politicians, but also to those that are independent and have a view and knowledge on um, envir environmental policies, including our office, when we assess the economic consequences of climate change. So you're updating this just as a final question, and we're going to get that later this year. Uh, will it? I know you've outlined that there's some changes with different provinces being part of it, and you'll know, carve out some home heating oil temporarily for a while. Is that all it will be? You're sticking with these, the fiscal and economic analysis. Will you include output-based pricing in it or just go back to consumer carbon pricing and, and do it that way? We plan on going back to consumer, like the carbon tax that everybody in under the federal backstop regime has to pay. We'll also underline again that this is not a cost-benefit analysis and that we are not indicating that, or we don't mean to imply that doing nothing mm -hmm is the right approach, a desirable approach, or even our recommendation, which we never do. Okay. Uh, Yves Giroux, Parliamentary Budget Officer, we'll want to have you back on when the new updated report comes out. Thank you for your time today, sir. My pleasure. Sir, there we go. I had us muted. My apologies. <laughs> so, yeah, there you have it. Um, not the most dynamic of interviews, um, a little dry, um, a little repetitive, but you see that uh, David Cochran was really pressing him. Um, it wasn't rude and it wasn't confrontational, but he wasn't having it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you're right, it wasn't, it wasn't rude. It was not confrontational. It really wasn't. But yeah, he, he he wasn't he wasn't having it. Yeah, and um, I don't know. Just yeah, I don't I don't quite know what to make of all of that. I mean, it was yeah. a lot of it was a lot of gobbledygook, quite frankly. Um, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't spelled out in layman's terms? Nope. It was difficult for me to follow along, and I'm not that astute, so I'm like kind of like I'm, he's kind of losing me here. So uh, it was difficult for me to follow. It, like what what exactly is taking place here? How how does the average Canadian citizen begin to understand this? And I think it's like they're talking above our heads, so they you know I I couldn't quite I I don't have an opinion right now because I'll have to watch that a few times just to make sense of it. <laughs> but it's sort of like. We have the two sides, right? We have the journalists asking, well, if the public has a right to know, and the public has a right to 
the best information in your like one of our slightly more than a handful of parliamentary watchdogs, mm-hmm. the privacy commissioner, the you know the auditor general, whatnot. There, you know, there's there's about like seven or eight of them, you know, that we hold high and above. Because you know, we have, they're actually they actually report back to parliament and not to the government, mm-hmm. right? Um, and they can only be fired for cause, right? So we put a lot of trust. We the, the, these these specific offices are are for all intents and purposes institutions. Oh yes, right. So I can understand from his perspective asking for the people. It's like, but you're an institution, and you made an error. And rather than t- bringing it to everybody's attention, hey, we made an error. This needs to change. Look, this will be coming out with new data at this time. You just sort of quietly corrected it. You know, it's like it's a month later, and and David Godwin's going like, like, we're freaking CBC. Yeah. And we didn't notice it till just now. Yeah. Right. So. Versus, I guess, him from his side. Well, it wasn't that big. That, yes, it was an error. Mm. Like this, it wasn't so much an error. We're calling it something like a tweak that needed to be made, and it won't ultimately change the result by the end. Like this, it, it was, there was an error, so we had to tweak it to fix it. But it's not statistically meaningful or significant. So. So, so we just corrected it that way. But you would still have, when asked the question, why did you do it that way and not do it the other way? Mm-hmm. That's a gobbledygook answer is not needed there, right? Agreed. Give us the straight goods. Like, really, and, I mean, there's no need to. Yeah. Had he just said that we don't have the final numbers yet, you know, like, mm-hmm. we were able to do some projections based on. Some early projections we figured it would not be me statistically meaningful it, it so, does not instill confidence so, so we made a decision that yeah, given the list that it wasn't required to bring that much attention to it because it may not have been popular but at least we have an expression in french mm-hmm. it's an answer that makes sense it's coherent it's logical with it like this it's maybe not the best thing to do options well, optics wise this but it makes sense right but we, it wasn't statistically significant, so we didn't feel like I had the need to bring that much attention to it. If it were, we would have. This, yeah, but with, you understand now how it's still wrong. Well, yes, we can see now how maybe it would have been a better idea given the trust. But you could, you could, that interview could have gone that way. Yes. Uh, it's, right. it's like, literally, I'm going to have to watch it. Out, you know, like this, it's not going to be that bad like this, but I guess we see how you know, we could have been. I am going to have to watch it again to make total sense out of it, though, because I was kind of like, is he speaking in circles right now? Is he giving me gobbledygook? Like, I mean, what, what's going on here? Uh, it, it just uh, it doesn't instill confidence. Let's put it that way. Yeah, no, 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 it doesn't at all. So, yeah, uh, there'll be more to come on that with these demands for resignation. Um, like I said, I'm, I can't assess myself how you know how big an, an error this is but it, it does affect the the ability to trust the next time the pbo says something because if there is a mistake this yes, you know will they be drawing attention to it and say you know mm-hmm. this happened like this or will they be trying to just uh, put it under the radar again and uh, there's only so many times you can do that This doggy here right now. She really um, needs to go out. I'm sorry. Yes, I know. <laughs> it's daddy, we need to go for a walk time. Yeah, yeah, we are. We're really at that point. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, Lola. Oh, Lola. Lola. She can't hear you. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's call it a, a show. Yeah, we'll call it a show. We'll wrap it up. Uh, kids and Cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love it. <laughs>
<laughs> suspended due to Lola. <laughs> and we love making this for you. Remember sharing is caring and word about this five list. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. Uh, if you don't want to miss an episode, you don't have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl. Um, she sponsored our pod page. So if you scan that QR code, that brings you to podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And when you click on subscribe, that makes it such that when, when, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. I'm speaking a little too quickly, so I'm going to slow it down just a little bit so I stop tripping over my tongue. And if you would like to support us in other ways, of course, we don't have Kit Elaine here telling us at the moment to, uh, smash that button on our YouTube page. Uh, but if you are watching on our YouTube page at the moment and you haven't clicked like, share, or subscribe yet, please do particularly subscribe because we're trying to get to a 1,000 before Canada Day. And uh, we've had a nice little jump since Friday. Advertising helps. Advertising helps. So uh, thank you very much, all those of you who have joined. We really appreciate it. And... If you would like to support us in yet another ways, well, there you go. Uh, the QR code by uh, Mr. Grizzly's head will bring you to our coffee page where uh, we have the e Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund waiting there for you. So if you have to, to have a bit of coinage in your pockets weighing you down and uh, you'd like this to help you lighten that load, well, if you go there and uh, you drop a few of them off, uh, you'll make sure that we stay hydrated so that we can keep on bringing you the show and... Uh, well, you'll be later on your feet. It's win-win. I think so. Tipping is very sexy. Wink. All right. Uh, <laughs> we love to hear from you. So write to us at truenortheagerbeaver at gmail.com. Find us on our Twitter feed at True Eager, our Facebook page, True North Eager Beaver. And uh, if you're leaving comments on our YouTube video, we see those as well. So thank you very, 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 very much for that. Um, because democracy is something that you do. Uh, if you are in Alberta, please get involved with the NDP leadership race so that you have the best candidate possible when it comes time for the next provincial election. And if you happen to be living in British Columbia or in Saskatchewan or in New Brunswick, since there are provincial elections coming this year, uh, please, please get involved. And maybe you would like to go to the polling station and uh, see what that's like. That's always a wonderful time. I really recommend it. All right. For the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying, it can be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, some words of wisdom, please. Yeah, take your dog for a walk before she makes a mess in your house. Got to go. See ya. Bye. Bye. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music.